Welcome to a mini lecture about Seifert surfaces and Seifert's algorithm. Um, we are now going to relate uh, the study of surfaces to the study of knots. Uh, so here is the definition. Uh, whoops, we don't use that color. Okay, definition. Uh, we're going to take a knot K. A Seifert surface for a knot K is a connected oriented surface embedded in R3, right, living in uh, three dimensions, and its boundary must be K. So a Seifert surface is a surface inside R3 whose boundary is our knot K. So here's an example. Uh, this is uh, just the white part of this picture is our normal, di well, our sort of secondary diagram of the trefoil. And uh, what we do is we uh, create this surface which has sort of two lobes, one on the right, one on the left, and three twisted strips in between them, uh, one for each crossing. Uh, so is it connected? Yes, it's connected. Is it oriented? Ah, the word shouldn't be oriented. It should be orientable. Orientable. Sorry about that. Is it orientable? Uh, yes, let me orient it. Well, if I orient it this way uh, clockwise, our normal clockwise on the right, and this our normal anti-clockwise, we're going to orient it clockwise on the left and anti-clockwise on the right. Then that is an orientation because if I pass through one of these twists, uh, it doesn't matter which one, I go from clockwise to anti-clockwise each time. So it is orientable. Let's get rid of those. Uh, we said it was connected as well. It's embedded in R3, as we can see, and its boundary is K. Um, so warning, it sounds like uh, I've made my surface just by chessboarding a diagram. Uh, that doesn't always work. Apparently I can't write right now, uh, so I won't do it. If you take a diagram, chessboard it, then you can regard your shaded regions uh, and the sort of twisted strips in between them as a surface whose boundary is your knot K. Uh, if the diagram was connected, then uh, so will your surface be, but there's no guarantee that the surface will be orientable. Uh, so if you try the other normal diagram of the trefoil, uh, take a chessboarding of that, you'll see that the corresponding surface is not orientable. So if you think I just played a clever trick, I didn't because it doesn't always work. Nevertheless, there is a theorem due to Seifert which says every knot admits a Seifert surface. So for, for every knot, there is a Seifert surface. And the proof is very simple. He constructs it, Seifert, this is Seifert's theorem, he proves it by constructing a Seifert surface for every uh, knot. So let's see how we do it. It's called Seifert's algorithm. It constructs a Seifert surface from a diagram. Okay, so step one, choose a diagram D and an orientation. So let's take uh, the normal, whoops, let's take the normal figure eight. Am I gonna get this diagram right? Yeah, it looks good, okay. Choose a diagram D and an orientation. There we go. We've done step one. And now I'm going to apply the algorithm to uh, this copy of my diagram. Uh, step two. Smooth every crossing according to the orientation. In other words, for each crossing I look at the uh, outward pointing arrows and I smooth it in the way that's compatible with those arrows. So let's do that in the example. I need to draw the arrows coming out of every crossing in both cases. Oops, that's like that. I didn't mean to do it there, never mind. Uh, this was our original diagram D. And now I need to smooth according to the orientations in each case. So that's going to be like this. Uh, like this. Like this. And like 
this here. Okay, good. Um, let's redraw that. No, we stick with it. We made our bed, we're gonna lie in it. Um, the resulting closed curves, now you see, because I've smoothed every crossing away, the result is just a union of curves, right? And the, these resulting curves are the Seifert cycles. So for this diagram, we got three Seifert cycles. Okay, our next instruction, actually, let's draw these in order. So this was step one. This was step two. That's a nice way of doing it, isn't it? Okay, good. Uh, here was step one. Here's step two. Uh, now let's do step number three. Fill in each surface, ah, fill in each cycle to form a disk. Fill each cycle to form a disk. Uh, so, for example, uh, I could fill in this cycle like this. That's a disk there. Uh, and now I should fill in this big cycle, right? And I should fill in this little cycle as well. Well, that sounds a bit awkward because I'm sort of crossing them over. So what I do is I imagine myself uh, nesting the diagrams if, if necessary. So what I do is I uh, lift this one out, I fill the one beneath it in, <laughs> bloop, bloop, bloop. and now I imagine myself sort of putting my hand somewhere in the middle here and pushing down a bit so that when I've filled in this disk, uh, is there a darker color I can fill it in with? Yes, I could fill it in with black. There we go. So that when I fill in this disk here, then I can sort of have it hovering above uh, the previous one. So you've got to imagine that this top one and uh, this middle one here are at the same height, whereas this one I've sort of pushed down in the middle so that things don't actually cross over in the end. Okay, and then step number four. This is gonna blow your mind. Um, step number four, add a twisted strip at each former crossing. So I look inside my diagram and I ask myself, where did there used to be a crossing? Well, so for example, here, there used to be a crossing like this, with this strand going over and these ones coming under. So into that, I insert a twisted strip, looking like this, and it joins together the two, uh, the, the, the disks on either side of the old crossing. Okay, so let me just do that. Let's get rid of everything, uh, back to the right color. Okay, so I reinsert my old crossing and join uh, uh, as a twisted strip like that. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing everywhere. Okay, there we go. And the next one, okay, so maybe, I don't know if this is gonna to add to the clarity, but there are the edges of the strips I've added in. And then finally, I've got to add two strips between this lower disc and this upper one, and they go in looking like this. Okay, so this is clearly uh, not a resounding success. Um, 
uh, Zyphert's algorithm is always really confusing. And uh, simply console yourselves uh, with the fact that all we need to know is the genus of the resulting surface. So we call the surface that we get out, it's called sigma d. And we have a proposition. It says if d has n crossings and the algorithm produces s Zyphert cycles, then the genus of this Zyphert surface is 1 minus s plus n over 2. So in our example, g of sigma d is equal to 1 minus the number of cycles, which was 3, we saw that in step 2, plus the number of crossings, which is 4, over 2. So that's 5 minus 3 over 2, which is 1. So we see that the genus of this surface we created was 1. OK, um, please don't worry too much about Zyphert's algorithm. There's some pictures in the notes which I think are better. Ah, what do I mean when I say don't worry about the algorithm? Don't worry about trying to draw this surface. Instead, just uh, make sure you know how to do the algorithm and to, how to compute the genus. OK, there we go.